break with the, fo- the normal pattern because I just feel like what I've, what I've prepared to share and, and the, the thing that I, God's laid on my heart for this beginning of this series uh, called Radical Living, um, I, I, I bel- it's difficult to say, I, I just believe that it'll break something in us that allows God's rule and reign in us. And so we're going to see where we land and go. I, by the way, I do know where I'm going to go and where I'm going to land. But I want to be interested to see what happens in our hearts this morning as I share what I believe I've got to share. But first, can I ask, uh, can anybody give me £100? Ben? Awesome, thank you. Can I come in? Hundred, £100, please. Yeah. Cash. No checks. Don't want it bouncing. Cash? No, no, no debit card? No? Okay. 10. Hundred pound. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Great. Isn't he generous? Imagine that. How can I say? Some, I, hundred, it is like proper hundred pound. One, two, three, four, five. You didn't print that this morning, did you, Ben? Awesome. Thank you. Just, just leave that there a moment. Okay, so I um, just said, uh, as we said at the moment, uh, we're going in a series called Radical uh, Giving, uh, Radical Living, and this morning we're talking about radical giving. Um, we're, we are talking, I'm talking about generosity, um, because I think our lives um, as Christians should be marked by things that are quite radical. All right, radical generosity, we should have radical marriages, radical parenting, radical dating, all of those kind of things. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be in this series called Radical Living, and we're going to be hitting some of those, uh, some of those topics, because they're, they're real life issues, aren't they? What do we do with our, how do we handle our finances? How do, we hand, how do we deal with marriage? How do we deal with dating? How do we deal with uh, parenting? And all those kind of things. Um, for some of you, you're not at the parenting stage yet, but one day you will be. And believe me, if you can get as much advice now as, as you possibly can, it'll serve you well. Um, so we want to deal with some of those things. Because radical living is not... It, it's just, it, to be honest, it's about living kingdom principles in a world that is opposed to kingdom. It's about living uh, our lives shaped by the culture of the kingdom, opposed to the culture of that which is around us. Because if you're if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, then you're going to be inhabiting places where you sometimes feel uncomfortable because the culture is different to that which is in your heart. Is that true? Please tell me it's true. Otherwise, I'm going to have to start again. And we've already had five minutes. Um, It's it's that. It is, it's radically opposed to, to what we believe or what we hold true, the values of the kingdom uh, in us. And so I, I just felt like I needed to address the issue of money. But there is a couple, uh, there's a few caveats I want to put out before um, doing so. Um, and these are this. And what I'm not saying is that you're not generous. Okay. So I'm not saying that you're not generous. But, what I, but, but through what I do say, may the spirit might just might ask you to become more generous. Okay, So I'm not saying that you're not generous. I'm just saying that the Spirit might say it's, it's time to ramp it up a little bit. What I'm not saying is that people who don't follow Jesus aren't generous, because I'm sure we all know non-Christians who are generous, right? Um, but what I am saying is that as a follower of Jesus, uh, I think we should be the most generous with what we have, not with what we don't have. Okay, so I think we should be the most generous with what we have, not with what we don't have. Okay, so generosity, it's not generous to put loads on the credit card or give what we necessarily don't have. We should be generous with what we do have and be thankful for that. So that's the first two. And then the other thing is that I'm, I am actually quite nervous about speaking about money. Okay, I, 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 this, I don't... There are a few topics I get nervous about talking about. Uh, money is one of them. So I am going to try and stick quite closely to my notes so I don't say it. One, don't say anything stupid, or maybe that wouldn't actually help. Um, but so that I, I get across what I feel like God wants to say in the manner that I think he wants me to say it. Is that okay? You're all very quiet today. Was it the talk of money? Or was it the fact that I've now got £100 sat on the lectern that you're kind of thinking, what's going on there? Okay, so 
Um, so I, I want to say I'm nervous about talking about money for several reasons. It can be misunderstood. It can induce guilt. It can offend. And it goes against our culture, which is in, it's intently, intensely private when it comes to finances. So how many of you like talking about money? How many of you like talking about other people's money? That's easy. How many of you like talking about your own money? It's not so easy, is it? Some of you are, are, don't mind talking about money, and that's great. We, we need you in the church. Um, but I just want to say right up front, there's some of the things that make me nervous because it can be easily misunderstood. If you, especially if you're here for the first time, you might be thinking, oh, man, is, this, is money all that they go on about at this church? Because you, you've got no, no frame, maybe no frame of reference. It really isn't. Um, and we're delighted that you're here. But the, the overriding thing for me when it comes to talking about money is that I've experienced that by having a different approach to money, it is actually a gateway for God's reign in my life. And I believe, that as the, t- t- the scriptures teach, I believe that our approach to money, if we approach it in a biblical way, is a, is an, is a gateway for us to acknowledge and to grow in the reign of God in our lives. Um, shall I, I just give you one a bit of a bit of background because um, I've not I've not always been generous and I'm not as generous as I would like to be. Um, but this is a bit of a journey that I'm on. I I, I made a I made a bit of a decision a, a few years ago that I wanted my life to be marked by generosity. I it, I wouldn't say it was a decision, but it was a process that I came through. Um, when I was at Bible college, poor student, not a lot of money, uh, student loan and all of that stuff. So, uh, and I'm sure others of you identify with that. I wrestled with how do I, how do I give what I don't have? And so I, I'm, I've got to be honest, I, I struggled through Bible college in terms of, of giving, but I sought to try and give what I could. But jump back a little bit further, my first job and um, working for the co-op and Securicore and, and probably not pulling in a great deal of money. And I had my, my mum and dad at that time had moved to Scotland and they were, they were pastoring the little church room in Scotland. And my brother and I, we were living in a house in Derby and, and my brother was 17, I was 19. And, and my brother didn't have much money. He, wanted, he was at college, he was trying to run a bike and all of that kind of stuff. And we had some friends in, uh, who we lived, shared a house with and, and they didn't have much money. And, and so it was kind of like every person fend for themselves so everybody chip in and uh, what they could but uh, you know there was a I was earning some money and I felt responsible for my brother but I was like how God how can I give tithe when oh, there's there's just not a lot anybody else face the same challenge it's, it is a challenge isn't it and so when I'm talking about this stuff please I, I, I really don't want anybody going, going, away, going away with guilt or thinking that Ian doesn't live in the real world. Because I do. But you realize the, the thing I want you to understand is the way that I try, we try and, Rachel and I try and handle our money now has been a journey, but we try and do it based not on feelings or what, what we think, but based upon what we, we know is true and right. So there's a decision that has to be made. And... And you, if you've been at this church for a, 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 anything over two years, you'll understand my love-hate relationship with the Vauxhall Sephira that we currently own. Okay? You, you, some of you know I previously had a... Anyway, I can see it. Ian, just move on. Um, right, so we got the Vauxhall Sephira a few months ago. Um, in fact, sometime last year, we got a letter through the post from the, the dealer that we bought the Vauxhall Sephira from saying, we can offer you great price on your car if only you will come in and see what's available. And I'm thinking, this sounds like a letter from heaven. <laughs> so I, I thought, Rachel, you know, let's go and see. So I went to see, went to have a look, and, and whatever you think of these cars, it, it, it was a, a Vauxhall insignia, quite high spec, SRI, you know, powerful engine. It was, it was I've got to be honest, it was a nice car. And I was, I, was, I was really tempted because they would give us a good price for the Vauxhall Sephira, but it would also mean taking out some additional finance on the Vauxhall insignia. 
And I'm looking at the finances. I'm thinking, Rachel, we can do this. We can. Come on. We can. We can do this. And, and uh, all the time, I've got this little niggle in, in my heart going, Ian, don't, don't do it. Don't be stupid. Don't be an idiot. You don't hate that car that much. Don't, to please, just, just don't do it. And so we, we sat and we chatted with the, the salesman, and he tried to make the figures work, bless him. And, and to be honest, he got to a point where we could have said, yeah, let's do it. Um, and I realized something when I was sat in that, set, that chair in that a showroom that actually what was going on in my heart was, was I was just coveting, actually. A bombshell, pastor covets. <laughs> Get the headlines out. I was, I was coveting the, a car because I was dissatisfied with the car that I had and what was wrong with my attitude wasn't actually the car it was the way that I approached the car that we had. I wasn't grateful. I was, I was mean-spirited. And so, please don't... When, so when I talk about um, generosity and journey of generosity and, and the journey of what goes on in our hearts, I, it's not something that just predates, like, Bible college or college and, and work. It, it's, it's current because our hearts are always trying to entice us if we let them away from following God and allowing God to reign in our hearts. So I, I, I sometimes think about what would have happened if I'd signed on the line and we'd have taken out a little bit of extra finance to, to have a, a car that I like to drive. I think we would have been in a bit of a pickle. And I think I'd have still been having a, a, a kind of a covetous um, outlook on money and finance and possessions. So do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? So I'm going to say I don't cover everything, just cars. <laughs> I don't really. Because actually through the whole process, I, I believe that God has done a, a tremendous work in me. Why do I say that? Not to, not to brag and not to talk about myself, but actually to emphasize the point that God wants to do a tremendous work in your hearts when it comes to possessions and finance and money that can only be done when we listen to the prompting of the Spirit and surround ourselves with the people who are of like mind and can speak into our hearts and challenge us. And, and on that occasion, it was my wife who spoke into my heart and challenged me on it. Okay, so there you go. The, there is a real uh, drive in our hearts that we can be gripped uh, by stuff. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who can be gripped by stuff. Nobody's nodding. But I know it's true. Because actually, generosity and giving doesn't actually come naturally to us, does it? It's not a natural thing. Like we've got two, two girls who are, uh, Sarah's two, Hannah's just turned four. And um, Sarah's in the point now where she's, she's starting to play a little bit more and getting it really in, she's really into toys and they, 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 they can have a little bit of a squabble, but Sarah is like, mine. <laughs> it's mine. Precious, it's mine. <laughs> Hannah, you're not having it. It's all mine. Even Hannah's toys are hers. And Hannah can be the same, you know, it's mine, I don't want to share, because it's not natural, is it, to share? Because we've got stuff, and therefore we, want to, we, we all have, to have this like default in us, we want to protect it. What I've got is mine. And so it, this stuff doesn't come naturally to us. Like generosity, I don't believe, is a natural byproduct of our heart. But I do believe it's a natural byproduct of a work of grace in us. That God does as we pursue him and place him in the primary place of our lives. Is this making some sense this morning? Please just nod. Uh, give me some encouragement on a nervous topic. Okay, and Andy Stanley, um, who is a, 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 just a great leader um, and, and pastor in the States, had this to say about generosity, because if we want to understand what gener generosity is, it's quite helpful to understand it in some way. And he, he, he came up with a bit of a definition. Um, I'm going to leave it with you to see what you make of it, but I, I quite liked it, so I'm going to share it with you if that's okay. He said, uh, being generous is the premeditated, calculated, designated emancipation of personal final financial assets. Did you get that? Nope. Right? Being generous is the premeditated, calculated, designated 
emancipation, that's the liberation, all right, setting it free of personal financial assets. Interesting, eh? So there's, there's a few things that as we go through that we're going to pick up out of that definition because I, I believe it captures something of what it looks like to be generous because generosity isn't simply just random acts. It's, it's planned and it's, 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 um, it's, it's purposed, it's, it's designated. And so uh, just hold, hold that definition in your mind as we go through. And if you want the, by the way, if you want these notes afterwards, uh, you can have them because there's, there's a few things that I'm going to be saying today. Um, he also mentioned that there were four myths surrounding generosity, which I, I thought were, again, were just very interesting and insightful, and maybe you'll agree with these. Um, generosity is spontaneous. Uh, ge- generosity that is, is, that is actually planned means it makes space for the spontaneous, but generosity isn't, isn't spontaneous. Like, if you just think about ge- being generous as spontaneous random acts, it's not... It's not really, it's, it's a random act, it's not, it's not generous because it's just, a, it may be just a one-off or a, um, a, 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 a little bit of a, um, a sporadic thing. So it's not, it's not spontaneous. Genero- generosity is uh, determined by cash flow. And this is a myth, that generosity is determined by cash, cash flow. He would say, um, but generous people are consistently generous, whether they have loads or whether they have little. It isn't about the amount. It's not about the cash flow. It's not about what's in the bank. It's an attitude of the heart. So generosity isn't determined by cash flow. Third, it's the amount that counts. How many of us think that it's the amount that we give that determines whether it's a generous gift? Andy Stanley would, would suggest that it's only really the person who's given the gift knows whether it's generous or not. So, for, you know, if, if somebody gives £800 uh, to a charity or to a local church or and to us, and we might say, wow, well, that's really generous. And then we might have, uh, uh, in the same offering or whatever, somebody who's given £8. And we might think, we don't. I think £8. You see, the, who, who knows whether that's generous or not? But the person who's given it, and God. Because if the person who's given the eight hundred pounds is sat on eight hundred pound asset in the bank, uh, eight, sorry, 80, 80 million pounds in the bank. Like not talking uh, assets in terms of buildings and stuff, but if they're sat on eighty million cash in the bank, then eight hundred pound gift. Is, would you say it's generous? It depends what else they're given, I guess. But you might think, oh, well, that's not very... And by the way, you wouldn't know whether they've got 80 million in the bank or not. But the person who's got 80 pounds in the bank and gives eight pounds, who's generous? Right, so it's not about the amount. The amount's not the benchmark of generosity, but... Because we don't know whether it's generous or not. Really, it's only God who knows whether that act is generous. And so, it's, uh, the fourthly, rich people are generous. What do we think to that? I think, I really agree that that is a myth. Because there are, there are some rich people who aren't generous. But there are some rich people who are really generous. But likewise, generous people are just generous whether they're rich or poor. It makes little difference in terms of what is in our account or what we have or possessions we have. Generous people will just be generous with what they have, not with what they don't. Generous people will be generous. Okay, so making sense so far? Okay, awesome. And so... I'm sure we'd all agree that generosity is, a, is an attractive trait. Would that be true? Like, you, if you're around a generous person, like there's something, it just rubs off, doesn't it? Like, you, you, it's kind of nice to be around somebody who's generous, not only because they'll probably buy you coffee um, or cake or a meal, but there's just something about the way that they are that just is good, isn't it? And so it's an attractive trait, whereas stinginess... It's not real, is it? 
Anybody know any stingy people? No, answer that. <laughs> so, gen- so um, what are some of the, what, what's one of the biggest barriers to us being generous? I wasn't rhetorical. Fear. Fear. Yes. Selfishness. Selfishness. Yes. Pride. Security. Yeah. What if? What if I give this and then I don't have? What if I give this and then suddenly I need? Like I, I actually think fear and worry, selfishness, security... I think they're all kind of just tied in and they're, they're, it just boils down to, well, what if I don't have? I think we worry. I think worry is the biggest barrier to us being a generous people. I think fear of not having the, or, or the grip of, of wanting stuff. Because if I give more stuff away and if I give more of my, my, my finance away, then I'll never be able to get that Mercedes or BMW. And it, 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 it's a, it, do you see how those, that kind of philosophy or thinking is just quite selfish and self-centered and worried about you? Whereas generosity would think kind of different. And so I, we, are, we maybe sometimes ask, can I afford to live a generous life? As a believer, as a follower of Jesus, I want to ask, you, can you afford not to live a generous life? Can you afford not to live a generous life? And we're going to jump on in. So what does the Old Testament uh, have to teach us? And we're just, I'm just going to put some things out there because there's stuff that I want to get to that Jesus says. So it talks about the idea of, of, offer, the idea of offering predates the formation of Israel. If you think about Cain and Abel and the mess that that ended up. And, and you, maybe they've got the question, why was, why was Abel's offering and Cain's offering not accepted? And, and the scripture says that it was Cain... Um, Offered the uh, when uh, in due in due course offered the fruit of the ground. In uh, he says of Abel, he offered the firstborn of his flock, and so there was an idea here about the uh, the the offering being the first thing that he was to give. Where Cain, it was almost like an afterthought. I, I believe that the, uh, the, the 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 scriptures are just full, full of God's generosity to his people and to his creation. I believe that we, we look through the scriptures as a whole, there is this thread and this theme of generosity and giving that goes throughout. So therefore, therefore, I just believe that generosity and giving is an eternal principle, not simply an Old Testament principle. If you think about the offerings of the Israelites, it was rooted in the freedom that God had given to his people. It was, it was for the operation of the priesthood and the tabernacle and the temple. It was, it was for those kind of things. It was, it, 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 was, it was out of God's generosity to them that they were to give. It talks actually about the 10%, doesn't it? If you read the Old Testament, you'll read the word tithe, which equates to this 10% of, of a person's income. Or, or in that case, the, the, the fruit of the land or the grain or whatever it was, they were to give a tenth of that over to God. And so there's this idea of the tenth. And you, you, may, you may or may not be aware that a lot of churches uh, will teach tithing and will teach about the 10%. And we're going to get to some of the 10% thing in a moment because um, I just don't find it really fascinating that the Old Testament talks about um, 10%. But what about the New Testament? What does Jesus have to say about money? First of all, I, I think I want to start with this, this idea of this theological understanding that God gave everything for the benefit of his creation. And so if we take the base mark from the Old Testament and the New Testament that God gave, God gave freedom to his people, he liberated them out of Egypt, he gave them a land flowing with milk and honey, and it's all good stuff. God was good and gracious to his people. And God has always been good and gracious to his people. So God doesn't change. He is the unchanging one. His character doesn't change. And so if, if, it, if we understand that God is good and he gives good, good things to his people and his world and his creation, then we, understand, we can understand that in light of Jesus. Do you remember we, we keep coming back to this, don't we? 
If we ask a question, what's the answer? Jesus. Because if we, want to, if we want to get a grip of the fact that God gave. Now, um, Jesus, God didn't just give a little bit. He gave everything. He gave Jesus. John 3.16. What does it say? Come on. Those of you who know it, speak it out. life everlasting so what is it God gave his only son now we, we're Trinitarian so we believe that Jesus is God so therefore Jesus as God gave himself everything so we understand that Jesus lived a life of 30 years largely in obscurity three years where he did ministry and gave of himself he healed the sick opened blind eyes set people free and then went to the cross and died on or died on the cross why did he do that? Well, if you want to understand that, you read, read the Hebrews, read the Old Testament, and you'll understand why Jesus went to the cross. And if you don't understand it, and you don't have time to read Hebrews, and you don't have time to read the Old Testament, can I encourage you at the end of the service, come and speak to me? Because I want to talk to you about Jesus. I want to tell you why Jesus gave his life. So he gave his life so that you and I might have eternal life and have freedom in him. Like eternal life, not just in, when we die and go to heaven, but now that we might enjoy the, foot, like just the increase of the kingdom in our lives now. He gave everything. So the first point, if one understand New Testament generosity, it's everything. It's all or nothing. God demands everything of us. If he was willing to give himself, he demands everything of us. Now, the beauty of it is he, he, doesn't, he doesn't strip us of everything. He doesn't strip us of our houses and our assets and our money, but he changes the way that we perceive those things. He demands everything because in everything we understand and view that this is given by who? God. And so, and Jesus, this is what Jesus says. And calling uh, the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return of his soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? And so Jesus is painting this picture of discipleship that says this is going to cost you everything. This is going to cost you your life. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. I, I want everything. So we go from the 10% of the Old Testament where they were probably quite happy with that to the, the everything of the New Testament where it's all in. All in. But by the way, even in the Old Testament, the remaining 90 wasn't just to be used willy-nilly. It wasn't just to be used like a scattergun. It was used to be a, as a, as a uh, one for the families and stewardship and all that, but it was used to be to the glory of God. And so um, we have this idea then that God requires everything of us. What else does Jesus say? He says the way that we spend our money will reveal where our hearts are. So had I gone for that Vauxhall insignia, what would it have, what would it have said about my heart? Got a bad choice of cars? Or would it have said that actually, Ian, you are thinking far more about stuff than about obedience to my, 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 my call, my priorities? Because to do so would have squeezed our margin, which meant that we wouldn't have been able to be as generous uh, as we would have liked to have been. So this is what it says. The, the, way, the way that we spend our money and use our money reveals where our hearts are. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for your, yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves are. Uh, do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And so I understand, look, we've got rents to pay, we've got mortgages to pay, we've got bills to pay, we've got all that stuff going on, haven't we? You don't? Okay, good. Because I'm going to say, I'm thinking I'm doing something wrong then. Right? We've, we've, we, I understand we've got all that stuff to pay. And we've got bills to meet. 
So what, what I guess I'm getting at is what, what about the surplus? <laughs> right? What about the, the, the maybe, maybe it's a lot, maybe it's a little. What is it we're doing with our finance? See, because I remember I just mentioned we had a little bit of margin in our finance that we could have gone for the car, but we chose not to. So if we squeeze the margin, then it's, it, 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 with, all, with stuff that we don't necessarily need, because we had, I had a perfectly work, good working car, the Vauxhall Sephira. I do love it. It would have just squeezed. What does it say about our hearts? So the question I want to ask, and I want to ask it gently and graciously, what is it? What is it that's in your heart? Where is your heart? Where is it your, whether you've got loads or you've got little, where is your heart? If you want to understand where your heart is, ask the question, where am I spending my money? Where am I spending the bulk of my money? Now, I'm not saying don't enjoy get computer games, don't enjoy coffee, don't enjoy those kind of things. But what I'm trying to say is that if all you're doing with your surplus income is spending it on computer games or on online subscriptions or on coffee at Costa or any other reputable coffee shop, <laughs> then what's he saying about our hearts? He's saying, I love coffee. Or I love computer games. More than I love the work of the kingdom. Because where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Is this making some sense this morning? Please tell me it is. See, because generosity is an issue of the heart. It's not an issue of amount. It's not an issue about, um, of anything other than an issue of the heart. See, because God's more interested in your heart than anything else. He's more interested in you becoming more like Jesus than anything else. And as far as I can understand and see, is that that Jesus was generous. Jesus was the most generous person that you could ever think of and ever try to replicate. See, because it's not about modifying our behavior, saying, well, oh, I'm going to, because Ian said that we need to give more, I'm going to give some more and I'll give it begrudgingly because I need to modify my behavior. It's not about behavior modification. It's about heart transplant. It's about heart change. It's about God working in us and responding to what the Spirit is saying. And the other thing is that Jesus says is we cannot serve God and money. Jesus never says that money in and of itself is evil. Like money isn't bad, is it? Like money isn't bad. It really isn't. But the love of money can stir up all kinds of evil. Jesus says you cannot serve God and money. No one can serve two masters, he says. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It doesn't say hate money. It doesn't say waste money. It just says don't love money. You see, one of the things that I, I, I just get a sense that goes on in us is that when we cover other people's stuff, and when we, when we think that other people... Are, are, are better off than us, or have more than us, or are richer than us. It, it kind of just brings a wrong focus into our hearts and minds that leads us down a path of loving and wanting and coveting what God has graciously and generously given to other people, rather than cultivating a heart in a, an attitude in our own heart of generosity, uh, of, of gratitude and thankfulness, thankfulness uh, of what we do have. When we try and control money, and when we, try and pr- uh, when we overemphasize money, and we love money, and we try to store up money, and gain money, and hoard money, and possessions, what it, what's it trying to say is that I'm in control of my own life, and I'm in control of my own destiny, and nobody can touch me because I'm, I'm storing up for the future, and you never know what might happen. And, you know, just, did, do you get what I'm trying to say? Is we, we think that we can control our lives by the fact that we control our money. 
And what we do when we try to control our money and what happens with it, and what, who doesn't have it, and we've got it all, what we're trying to say, we're saying, I'm God. Well, my money's God. And I just believe that God wants to break that in us. So if we, we sang the song, let your kingdom reign, for some of you this morning, for some of you, and this isn't in my notes, your money might be the place where you have to start allowing God to reign. Your money. The very thing that, uh, that God, whether it's um, whatever, however God has given uh, you what you have. Do you need to change the, perce- the way that you perceive what you have? Not as yours, but as what God has given. Again, Andy Stanley has got some good stuff to say on this. Said this: If you cannot control where it ultimately goes, you don't own it anyway. You see, this, this is what he said, uh, this, uh, off the back of this. Jesus said this to to his followers take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions and he told them a parable saying that the land of a rich man produced plentiful and he thought to himself what shall I do for I have no uh, nowhere to store my crops and he said I will do this I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and there will be st- I will store all my grain and my goods And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat and be merry. Drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool. I I, I can't help but say that with a BA or think that with a BA Baracus accent. I realize that only a few of you know who BA Baracus is. (laughs) That was the reason I got rid of the beard because it was starting to show some gray, telling me old age. Anyway, fool, fool, this is your... Soul, uh, your soul is required of you, and the thing you have prepared, uh, you have prepared. Whose will they be? So is it with the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God? You see, actually, I think by hoarding, by trying to gather, we we actually do more damage to our soul than we realise. I think it's a little bit like the, the guy mentioned in this parable. I think when we are not generous toward God and store up treasure for ourselves, when we're not rich toward Him, it's like a little piece of us dies. When the person, um, uh, so let me say about this, when the person, uh, Ben, the person Ben, when Ben gave me the hundred pound back, why do you think he was so quick to give it me back? Because it wasn't his. And he knew that I know where he lives. <laughs> it wasn't his. It wasn't his to keep. Now, I, I could say, like, this, this, this was my hundred pound and I gave it to Ben. And I might say to him, Ben, do you know what I want you to do? All right, Ben. Right. You weren't expecting this, were you? No, I went. Right, okay. Okay. This got exciting. It did just get exciting for you, didn't it? <laughs> right. So, Ben, because it's my money, I can do with what I want with it, can't I? So, if I choose to give it to Ben, that's my decision. Now, some of you are thinking, why didn't he pick me? <laughs> Aren't you? And some of you are thinking, Ben, I'm really pleased for you. Mm. Mine's a latte. <laughs> True? Some of you be thinking, why, Ben, why, 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 why haven't you picked me? And so, it is my money. I took it out of the cash point this morning. So, Ben, what I want you to do, and this is what I believe God does with us. There's 50 quid. All right? Next week, I want you to report back to me what you've done with it. Okay. All right? To the church. Don't go missing. I know where you are. All right? Okay? I want you to understand the principle. Right? What you have, you don't own. What you have, you don't own. 
You have it because God has given it to you. Whether you have much or you have little, you are stewards. We are stewards, not owners. And God can give abundantly to who he chooses to give abundantly. And as, as fellow stewards, we should rejoice and give thanks. And you know what? For some, that might be really difficult. But the more you practice gratitude and thankfulness, and the more that you celebrate with other people's, other people's abundance, oh, it does something in your heart. You may never be rich, but you'll be rich in your heart. So we're stewards, not owners. Generous people see themselves as stewards, not owners. What about the parable of the talents? And the, the man who was given... Uh, five, and then you know the, the way that it scales up, and he's saying, God's saying, I can, I, I can trust you because you've seen it increase. So, Ben, I want to see it tenfold. <laughs> and then give it me back. <laughs> no, don't. I don't. I do want to know what you've done with it. All right? Because I believe that when we see ourselves as stewards, we have a different perspective about the way that we handle the money we have. Because we realize that one day we're going to have to give an account for it. So I've asked Ben to give an account for how he spent it. You see, one day, I believe we'll give an account for how we've lived our lives as Christians. As followers of Jesus. As people who, are, who, are, who have been blessed much. We'll have to give an account for all of our life. And it includes our money. Okay. So what are the benefits? Benefits. All right, the other thing I need to say is that give in accordance with your income. All right, this is, some of the other, this is one of the other things that the New Testament teaches. Give in accordance with your income. Don't, if, you, if you earn 80 quid a week, that's all you get. And you know that you've got, don't, don't, give, don't give half of it away. That's not proportionate to your income, is it? Now, you might feel that one week, the Spirit of God really says to you, give 40 quid of it away and just see what I'll do. But you, I think the principle is, unless you hear otherwise, give in proportion to your income. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. Because it's not about amount, it's about the heart. And so what are the benefits of a generous life? Um, Acts um, Acts. Chapter 20, 35. If you, you want to flick there, you can. You might want to underline it. You can. But this is what Paul, uh, speaking to the Ephesian elders, says. And he says, uh, this of Jesus. And this, I believe, sums up the benefit of living a generous life. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Short and sweet. It is more. Ble- In fact, I could have just sat, stood up and said that this morning, couldn't I? It is more. Ble- You're all nodding. <laughs> it's more blessed to give than to receive. You see, I believe that a generous life will bring it brings greater joy, not fear. I believe that we, we, if we live a generous life, we will have greater level of joy and peace and security in all the things that we want than if we have to live a life of stinginess and hoarding and ownership. I think that's the thing that, that breeds fear because you have a fear of what you, what you might lose. And if you're not afraid of what you might lose, you don't need to be ruled by fear because if you understand it's not yours anyway, you'll deal with it well, you'll steward it well, but you'll give glory and honor to God with that which he's given to you. Make sense? Okay, so that, I believe that's the primary benefit. And I, I also believe that the way that we handle our money will affect the, the way that we grow spiritually. I can, I can, I can say that because I think, it's true, I think it's true in my own life, actually. I think the way that we handle money is a gateway to spiritual growth. You see, unlike, unlike some preachers, they will preach that you give and you will get tenfold, hundredfold, whatever, and you know you get all these material possessions. They're placing the emphasis on the wrong thing because it's not about what you get. It's not about the material. It's not about. It's, uh, it's just not the heart, the heart and the, the motivation, the attitude. You see, you want to capture the heart of God's God's generosity. You want to live out of that abundance that God has given. Not to receive. And if you receive stuff, that's 
that's a bonus. Like I've got to be honest, like some of you will know that I, just recently, I have, somebody has been so, so very generous to, to Rachel and I. And uh, you know, we're, we're really thankful. You know, they, they gave, somebody gave us a second car. You know, they saw, uh, saw a need. And so I'm just really, I'm amazed by that. And I'm really thankful for that. But, you know, the, the reason why, I, why I've been giving is not so then I think, oh, give, so then that happens. Because that's just manipulation. God doesn't work by manipulation. Because he's not, he's, he's not bothered with... He's, I just don't think he's bothered whether you've got stuff or you've not got stuff. He wants your heart. He wants your heart, top and bottom of it. And the, the less tightly we hold on to this stuff... And the more we see our, ourselves as stewards, not owners, the greater the gateway for a life, I believe, of spiritual growth. Anyway, so what do we learn? Actually, giving hurts. <coughs> giving can hurt, can't it? Because, you know, there's, there's times in our lives where we've given, and we, to be honest, we've seen no, we've seen no material gain. But as I reflect on it, I understand some of the pain that was caused was actually for my good and my growth. Like, it's not always easy to give. Since when did Jesus ever say it was easy to give? And so sometimes it can hurt us as we give. But it's an act, it's a spiritual discipline, it's a, it's a response to God's generosity to us. And so... I'm going to wrap up. But I want to tell you that I, the, the things that I'm about to say, I'm, I'm saying it because we practice it. I'm saying it because it's part of my, my, mine and Rachel's practice. And it's because I think it's biblical. Uh, some biblical principles for the way that we can deal with money and f- free ourselves from some of the, the, challenge, the, the challenge of it um, just holding on to our hearts. And so Rachel and I do tithe. You know, you might not see, when the basket comes around, you might not see us putting anything in. It's because we've set up a standing order that at the first of the month, um, I've, we've set that up. And I would, previously I would have just transferred it at the, end of, um, at, the, at the beginning of the month and done it electronically. I've just set up a standing order that goes, goes straight into the uh, church account every, every month. So we give. I want you to know that we give to this church. And, uh, and so... That's one way, but I'm also really aware that it's easy for that just to go, isn't it? How, you know, if, you, if, you'd set, if you've got a standing order going, it just goes, and you think nothing of it, do you? Until you see your bank statement maybe a few weeks later, you think, oh, yeah, I gave my tithe. And so what I've just done is I've just set up a, a little reminder on the first of the month in my iPhone to just jog my memory that, the tithe is, that my, tithe, my giving has gone out. And I'm going to say, God, I thank you for that. Thank you for that which you've given to me. And I want that to be used and blessed for your kingdom. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Otherwise, it just, it just, it just goes. And it doesn't become an act of worship. And, and actually, our giving is an act of worship. And so uh, we tithe. And we, uh, we, we give offerings. So we, we support people. And again, I'm not saying this to brag. This is not a brag. But this is to say, this is, what, this is how we operate our lives and this is what I, I, the benefit of, spirit, of spiritual growth and God's uh, goodness in our hearts and lives is, is just as a result of that. But we don't do it, we don't give to get, we just give because of God's generosity to us. And so we, we seek to live that out in our lives. And, and so we, just, we also just seek to try and bless people any way that we can. And if we meet people for coffee or cake or whatever, we'll, we'll often have. Well, there's been, actually, there's been a point where I've had arguments with people about paying. Because they want to pay, because they're generous. And I want to pay, because we're generous. And it's like, we have a back and forward, and we end up with a bit of a tussle. No, we don't. Um, but we, we would just seek to try and do that. Because it's just, that's the way that we want to live. So it doesn't have to be big, grand gestures. But an act of generosity. So how... How can you do it? How can we do it? And how can we continue to grow in a life of generosity? Be consistent with your giving. Be consistent. The best way is be consistent. And one of the ways that we practice that is, is to tithe. We tithe every single, every single month. We give of our offering. And we give of our, our finance.
And it's consistent. It's a consistent reminder that what we have is God's. Um, I think and we, we can uh, prioritize our giving. And so why at the beginning of the month and not at the end of the month when all the bills have been paid? Because if we put it at the beginning of the month before anything else is goes because no, no, I, 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 we try and get it before anything else goes but you know we have some standing orders work. And yeah. the, the point is, is a, we want it to be the first thing. We want it to be the first thing. And so prioritize your giving first things first. I think that's a principle. And by not, not leaving it to the last, not giving of the leftovers, by saying at the beginning, right at the start, God, this is what I'm going to give to you. Determine in your heart, Paul says. What you've determined in your heart, give. What you've determined. And so it means that you're going to have to have a plan. Right? You, might not have a, you might not have a financial plan. You might not operate budgets. Now, I'm... I, Rachel does all our budgets, and she's brilliant at it. Now, Rachel's more generous because she's married to me. I'm better with my money because I'm married to Rachel. <laughs> true. It's true. Um, I, I, you know, I, it's just the, the way it is. And so you, but you need a plan. You need a plan to work to. And if you don't plan for your giving, if you don't plan to give... Don't plan it. It won't happen. Because you'll get to the end of the month, you'll have had too many coffees or too many games, and you'll think, oh, I've got... You'll come to church and we do the offering, and you'll think, fiver. Now, fiver might be all that you can give. But what I'm trying to say is, it's not, as I said earlier, it's not about the amount. It's just about giving God the best. Giving God the first giving God priority and the way that we do that I think is the way that we order our finances be intentional and random create margin now some of you might be stacked up with some debt some of you might be debt that you're managing and you're able to service and and that's fine it's maybe just the way of the world that we live in but maybe for one or two of you 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 you're listening to this you're thinking Ian that sounds really great but I'm I'm sinking I just don't know where to go with this now, if that's the case, there are people that can help. I'd like, uh, you know, if, if that's so, please contact me at the church office and I can put you into contact with people because I believe that God has a, a, has a better way for you and I believe that there are people who can help you and it doesn't always have to be the way that it currently is. And so, um, the, yeah, there's, there's people that we can put you in contact with. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude and hang out with generous people. Cultivate an attitude of gratitude and hang out with generous people. In a moment, and I wonder if the servers would come forward, because we're going to finish with communion. And we're going to do it purposely, because um, we're recognizing that God, he gave everything. This very act of communion, of taking this um, bit of bread and this bit of juice, is recognizing that he, Jesus gave everything for us. And so as we do it, as we sang the song earlier, let, where you reign, reign in us, your kingdom reign in us, as we take communion, I wonder if together we could do that, just and say that and pray that, declare that, that God, may you reign in us. May you reign over my finances. May you reign over my marriage. May you reign over my work. May you reign in my school. May you reign in my university. May you reign in my life. And if you've never, if you've never, become a, you've never been a follower of Jesus, you've never professed to be a follower of Jesus, and you're, you're interested in Jesus, and you, you're, you're, you're just, the curiosity in you is being stirred. And I, I'd, I'd love to speak to you afterwards, because I believe that maybe Jesus might be inviting you to follow him, to recognize that he gave everything for you, so that you could know the life that he's called you to live, a life of, of abundance, a life of, of fun, a life of just known, being known and found in him. So if, that's, if, you're, if you're here this morning and that, that's you, then I'm going to hang around at the front for a little while. I'd love to speak to you. Um, if you want to come and speak to me at the end of the, uh, the, the singing the last song, that's fine. But I realize that might be a really brave move. But please, if you feel something stirring in you, come and see me at the end of the service. So I wonder if the service could come forward. Uh, but musicians come back. We're going to take communion together and then we're going to finish with some coffee uh, together. My round. <laughs>